Colorado has a popular Democratic governor, Jared Polis. He might run for president someday. Polis piqued my interest because he says things like this. I'm for more freedom and lower taxes. More freedom and lower taxes? Who is this unusual Democrat? I sat down with him for almost an hour. We argued about some things, but also, fortunately, found common ground. Before you were in this ugly field of politics, you, you did really useful work because you were an entrepreneur. What did you learn from that? That's really where my heart has always been. I started several companies, uh, internet-related companies, uh, ProFlowers, uh, Internet Access Provider, and uh, a number of others. I really enjoyed that work. And, and actually, it, it really helped prepare me for public service in ways that people don't expect. I mean, when you're starting something out, you're kind of taking on the world with an idea. You have a new way of doing something and never been done before, a different approach. You're building it from the ground up. And likewise, there's too much uh, inertia in politics. And so how do you kind of just break that down and get people to think about things a little differently and do them in a different way? I want to push back on your use of the phrase public service. I think you did public service when you ran a business. Why is government only called public service? Yeah, that's true, John. So, you know, because you, you ask a lot of entrepreneurs like me, you know, what, what motivated you? And, and, you know, you can say making money, but Beyond that, with the flower company's example, what excited me every day is that we were about connecting people. And, and it was about, you know, somebody courting somebody or a uh, son sending their mother flowers for Valentine's Day. I mean, that was the exciting part um, of what drove me. So, yes, I do like to think a flower company or, as you said, any company that adds value does something in a more efficient way, a better way, uh, is certainly a form of, uh, a form of service as well. You also started two charter schools. Mm -hmm. That was really fun, too. And, and that was uh, sort of applying entrepreneurship to the social sector, saying, so, look, I, I know how to start a business. I um, learned about education because I was on a board of education. And I said, I'm going to put these two together, and I'm going to start uh, a new public charter school to serve uh, kids. And I started two. I started one that works with English language learners, older new immigrants, like 16, 17, 18-year-old non-English speakers, and another that worked with youth that had issues with housing, homeless or uh, didn't have certainty around their housing. And so that was really, really, really exciting as well. I was superintendent of uh, New America School, which worked with the immigrant youth for a couple of years. Here, it's actually, we can talk to the teachers. They actually help you a lot. And then the feds came out with some anti-charter school regulations, and you spoke out against it. Yeah, that was more recently, right? So that's uh, so I started the charter schools close to 20 years ago, if you can believe it. They're still going strong, both of them. Uh, and just a couple years ago, the Department of Education put out some rules around charter school startup grants that were very restrictive. They didn't really uh, understand kind of the value uh, of innovation of charter schools. And so I did uh, I did take those on, was fairly critical about it. Um, and, and to their credit, they modified them somewhat. I mean, I argue they still weren't necessary, but they, they made them workable, which was good and, and not a detriment to the charter school they, movement. They do a lot of stuff that isn't necessary, the federal government. Oh, I'm State sure. Government. I'm sure government in general does a lot of things that aren't necessary, for sure. Libertarian pushback. You start these charter schools, but Colorado lags in school choice. Something Democrats oppose. Other states are way ahead of you. And, and your school choice is only for the public schools. Yes. So we have uh, uh, public school choice. And, and uh, I, I don't think Colorado lags. It probably de depends what indicator you're looking at. Well, I Florida, mean, Arizona, Utah now have universal school choice. Yeah. So we, we are one of the highest uh, uh, states by elevation. So pardon the pun. We are by elevation. Uh, but also uh, about 15% of our, our students go to charter schools. So I think it's uh, it's maybe third or fourth highest after Washington, D.C., a couple others. So we're like about 15% of uh, students go to public charter schools, uh, which are public schools with site-based autonomy. They have their own board that runs them uh, separately from the district. And I think that's meaningful. I, I do believe that choice should mean quality choice. I'm not a fan of these voucher programs with no accountability where it can be, you know, Joe's Taco Shop and K-8 Academy and they're getting taxpayer money. This is money that is collected. There's a public interest. You have to have some accountability. You have to have something there if people are collecting it. You're not, you know, you don't want to be buying somebody's but yacht. the government runs schools are no, accountable? We no, we don't have to run it. Charter schools, the government doesn't run directly, right? So school districts 
uh, run schools, of course. And, and by the way, many school districts do a fine job. Others don't. And even within a school district, charter schools have their own board. They're autonomous. There could be a chain. of We have chains of charter schools in Colorado. Um, so I, I think that it, at the end of the day, though, there's got to be that accountability. You're not just, you know, handing out uh, taxpayer money. Um, it's got to have the accountability back to the taxpayer. You passed universal preschool. Mm -hmm. Governor Polis signed into law a bill giving parents 10 free hours per week of preschool education for their child. So government needs more years with our kids at taxpayer expense? So this is part of our, uh, we call it saving people money agenda. We added free preschool, uh, which saves a family of a four-year-old about $6,000. Now, it's full parental choice for free preschool. It they can keep the kids home. Uh, you can, it's optional. Yeah, it's optional. Also, private providers, private schools are fully able to participate in that. It's not through school districts. It includes community providers, schools, uh, charter schools, kind of that whole network of early childhood providers. So it's really wherever uh, you want to send your kid, um, you know, they have to sign up and be part of it. And some, and they don't all have to because it's a certain dollar amount. I mean, some might have a Cadillac program, and that's fine. But this one is about a six thousand uh, dollar support for that. But even the government studied Head Start, which everybody loves, mm -hmm. and found it made no difference. Why fund something that makes no difference? Well, we are going to tie it into results. First of all, there's a, a strong body of data that shows that a, a, a high quality early childhood education yeah, leads high to better quality, outcomes. High quality, everything is great. Quality, you you don't get a lot of that in government. But it's two other things. It's also a workforce issue today, meaning that there are people that are out of the workforce because they have um, a high cost of child care, so saving people money. And it's money in people's pockets for rent, for travel for whatever else they're doing, because at the end of the day, it saves a family of a four-year-old uh, about $6,000 a year. So yes, I'm happy to, on the merits, talk about the benefits of the child, because high-quality programs do benefit the child, but we need that workforce, and it saves the family money. So it's really a triple hit on that one. I'll look at some of these things you did that I like uh, and seem libertarian to me. You signed a free-range parenting bill. You said just because a kid's playing alone outside, it doesn't mean they're in danger. Yeah, this was important because this is actually happening in a number of states where families get caught up in child protective services. And obviously, they play an important role if a kid's being abused. But they got caught up in that whole process just because somebody said, oh, the kid's on the playground. And then all of a sudden, the family had to enter the system. That alone should not constitute child abuse. There's a broad range of parenting styles. Some parents are helicopter parents. They're Never let their kid be more than, you know, three feet from them. Others say, go down to the park and play. You know, you're nine or you're 10, and uh, maybe that's the way you grew up. When I was a kid, that was, you know, it's a little bit less common now. But all those are kind of within the realm of, of ordinary. And so you shouldn't get tied up in this bureaucracy that's designed with a very important goal in mind, preventing child abuse, because there's real abuse out there, uh, just because parents are making decisions to let their kids play in the playground. But when government gets involved, it means the helicopter parents in government want to dictate what the free-range parents can do. For their own kids, they should be able to do that, not for other kids. So if you want to watch your kids super closely, that's your right. You know, I see parents who watch their kids on leashes. That's that's fine. You can do that. And another parents just say, you know, be back by supper. Uh, and, and those are all, you know, those are all have different benefits and costs. And it's really up to families and parents to make those best decisions for them. Reason Magazine says you may be the most libertarian governor. Are you? Well, that's that's for them to say, not not me. Do you I, consider I don't know. yourself libertarian? You know, when you say government doesn't does a lot of things that they don't need to do. You know, one of the things that I used to I was in Congress for a number of years. One of the things I used to vote for in many cases were these one uh, percent uh, or three percent spending cuts, just sort of across the board or in different departments. Um, to, you know, Department of Defense, uh, others that are just these huge ticket items. But um, yeah, can, can, can the federal government do more with less? Yes, they can. Um, they absolutely could find a few percentage points of fat, and they could probably get a bigger and better impact if they aligned what they do with incentives of, of how people actually operate. But you're not comfortable calling yourself libertarian. Well, I, I figure it's really up to libertarians, and some might call me socialist, some might call me libertarian. I mean, it's, it's up to what's ever in their own mind. You know, like anything, uh, Democrats, Republicans, libertarians, these are these are very broad uh, sp movements, right? And so you have people in all of those tents that, you know, would 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 call me everything from a 
a socialist to an anarchist. I mean, it just depends where they are on the spectrum. And it says more about them than it does about me, whatever they call me. During the pandemic, you were less authoritarian than other Democrat-run states. I was proud that we went back to normal, uh, one of the earliest states to kind of end that initial stay-at-home period. Our businesses reopened really early. Uh, most of our school districts got back fairly early, like in many states. Some of the cities took a little bit longer. But we really pushed that uh, personal responsibility angle very heavy from the start, saying, look, um, you're in the best position to you know, assess your risks. And I mean, yes, if you have your you know, grandparents living at home, you have a high risk of the virus, you might make different decisions. And if you're um, young and healthy. So those are really best made by individuals. You hate the income tax. I do. I think that, and I've been proud, by the way, we've reduced the income tax twice in Colorado since I've been there. We started at 4.63%. Now it's 4.4%. It went to the voters. I supported it. We were reduced it twice. Uh, income is something that's good. Uh, in general, when you look at taxation, and you're not against all taxation, you agree, government needs money. Needs money to operate. And I mean, the income agree. tax sure. is fairer than some other taxes. Well, what I don't like about it is it penalizes success. It penalizes something that's good, which is income. Uh, when I look at taxation, I say we should we should taxation is a form of penalty. You know, for whatever dollar amount we're talking about, let's talk revenue neutral. Whatever dollar amount you know you think government needs, and you know you agree on an amount, how do you get it? So uh, I would say you get it from taxing things that are bad, and that might mean like for instance a pollution tax, or it might mean things that have other externalities like alcohol and cigarettes. Um, income is something taxes. that is good. Um, yeah, I mean, pollution is a broader tax than that. If you tax pollution, it's um, something that makes everybody less healthy. Uh, it has a cost to it. It's something that unequivocally is bad versus income, which is unequivocally good. I mean, we want everybody to make more income. We don't want everybody to make more pollution. So you try to discourage uh, what you can through the a tax system, sort of setting aside the, the revenue neutral level, whatever level you agree on, you need to run government, uh, you then decide how to get it. And I think a broad-based pollution tax is probably the better way to do that than an income tax. And you move to end the sales tax on diapers. It is now illegal in the state of Colorado to charge sales tax on items like diapers. We did. Like in most states, uh, I think most states have this where groceries don't, you don't pay sales tax on groceries, necessities. We expanded that category of items where there's no sales tax to other things that you can, you know, I would say are necessities. So diapers, and by the way, that's kids diapers and adult diapers, um, uh, feminine products, kind of a whole host of products where we said no longer subject to the sales tax, just like groceries. In some ways, this is the sort of micromanaging that libertarians criticize because the grocery clerk now has to make, has to know what's taxable. Well, they already had to do that. So like, I think this is probably the case in most states, but in our state, in Colorado, so groceries, you don't have sales tax. I think that's probably the case in most states, but prepared foods like restaurants and now most grocery stores also have prepared foods. Those have the sales tax. So I didn't, I didn't write those rules, John. But but I'm saying it didn't add any work because they were already doing this. And so we just added more uh, items to the category that does not have a sales tax is what we, what we simply did. You mentioned sin taxes, discourage mm -hmm. bad behavior. But you passed them on vaping products saying... We have a, a moral imperative in our state to do more to prevent teen smoking and teen vaping. But vaping saves lives. It's better than smoking. Yeah. There's been people trying to ban it or restrict it. I've been against that. What we basically did is we had a bit of what you might call a loophole. We, we had a nicotine, we had a cigarette tax. We still do cigarette, cigars, but vaping had no tax. So we said, let's just, whatever the product is, let's be agnostic and tax it on nicotine level. You're going to pay a lot more for cigarettes, also e-cigarettes and vaping products. And so vaping is now pulled into that and you but know, it's tax the smoke at a reasonable that level. kills, not oh, the nicotine. Yeah, but, no, vaping has been effective in helping people get off of smoking. We've been against efforts to uh, eliminate it. It's also, uh, you know, the flip side of that, it's also led to uh, more nicotine addiction, especially among young people who can discreetly use it where it's harder to use cigarettes. Announcing your plan, you're wearing a mask at the podium, outdoors, standing by yourself. That looks unscientific. My plan for what? For vaping. No idea. What, I don't know what was going on then. I'm not sure. I was probably trying to model the behavior of masking. I, I you know, I, I didn't always mask, but I, um, you know, it was people's choice in Colorado. I mean, there were some cities where you had to do it like anywhere, but we, uh, moved away from that as a statewide. We never had an outdoor requirement, by the way. Colorado never said you had to mask outdoors. But I, I did try to model uh, during the height of the pandemic, you know, behavior that I thought uh, people should do. And 
Um, so I certainly, you can certainly find pictures of me wearing a mask around. I wasn't averse to that. Inflation, which persists and wrecks older people's lives. You have a take on it I've never heard from a politician before. Fight it with immigration and getting rid of tariffs. Yeah, uh, those are two national solutions. So to be clear, I can't do either of these in Colorado. And I'm, I'm happy to, you know, we're lowering taxes. We're trying to save people money where we can. But the two things that kind of law would lob into the federal government and say, please do this, is get if, if you get rid of just the Trump era tariffs, it would save the average person over $700 a year. Um, and that would wipe about half a point off of inflation, just getting rid of the Trump era tariffs. And I'd say go further. Let's negotiate tariffs down um, even beyond just getting rid of the, the ones that uh, Trump put in. Trump said he was just punishing China and protecting American consumers. Well, he was passing the bill along American consumers because to the tune of over $700 a year. So tariffs uh, are a form of taxation, right? Just like everything else. So if you want to discourage trade, uh, we talked about how taxes discourage something, they penalize something. Uh, tariffs in particular penalize trade. I think trade's a good thing. If two people, willing partners, both have something and they both uh, want what the other has and they make an exchange, they're both better off, we should not penalize trade. So President let's bring Trump those said tariffs that down. trade is taking away American jobs. Trade is good for both sides, inherently, by its definition, because both sides want to do it. They willingly enter a, a trade. It's voluntary. And they both are, they, they, it's a voluntary trade and they both... Uh, accrue a benefit from it. So by its very definition, the trade would not occur if either side was hurt at all by the trade. Um, so trade is good. It's an important part of our economy. Taxing trade is not good. It costs the average family $700 in additional inflationary costs. Um, inflation uh, with the immigration is another part of that solution. We have a labor shortage in this country. So in Colorado, we have two job openings for every unemployed person. Uh, this is an artificial labor shortage, because we have people, even people who are here today that are perfectly willing to work, they just don't have the right federal permit to work. And so, yes, whether it's comprehensive immigration reform, which I've long been supportive of, or whether you simply say states, you can give temporary working permits to people that you want and that can hold down jobs, I'd be good with that. Whatever we can do, this would boost the economy, reduce inflation, uh, and and help improve our overall productivity. But to be fair, both trade and immigration do take away some American jobs. Well, right right now, at least in Colorado, and I think this is in many parts of the country, again, we have more job openings than we have workers. Now, there's a skills gap, and we want to address that. And I'd love to talk about some of the exciting stuff that we should be doing, we are doing in Colorado, on workforce, apprenticeships, uh, skills-based hiring, uh, community college programs, not all the way to associate's degrees where people get the skills they need. But in the meantime, we need to make sure that we're able to power the private sector by being able to get the jobs we need. So yes, I think that trade is good. Uh, immigration, as long as people are willing to work and play by the rules, is a good thing. Uh, it's one of the strengths our country has. The countries that have an, a real immigration problem are countries that people are, that the best and brightest and hardest working people are fleeing. Those are the countries that have a problem. We're still that country that the best and brightest and hardest working people from the, across the world want to come to. And that is one of our assets. We need to better capitalize on that asset. Magic mushrooms will soon be legal here in Colorado. Your state has led the country in drug legalization, marijuana and now psychedelics. Is this a good thing? Yeah, it has been very good. We were one of the first states to legalized marijuana, and, and we did it in a thoughtful way. It's regulated, like alcohol or tobacco. You have to be 21. Uh, you know, we monitor the supply chain and make sure there's no criminal element. We put a lot of the corner drug dealers out of business that would sell to a 16 or 15-year-old. It's harder to get marijuana if you're a kid in Colorado. Underage use has gone down since we've legalized it. Uh, it's created jobs, tax revenue, um, and it's led to a safer product for those who choose to recreate or, or use it as medicine. The voters just passed um, approving the legalization of um, psychedelics, and that is going to be new. That's a different thing. It's never going to be the market size of marijuana. This is more, and you might have friends that have done this. I certainly know people who have. It's kind of like a, a mental health intensive treatment where if you're trying to break the cycle of addiction or severe depression, uh, you go and you do um, a, a course under, under um, uh, safe conditions. And, and many people have talked about how uh, anecdotally how it's been helped them turn their lives around. Of course, we want to see a lot more uh, medical, um, you know, publishing on this and, and, and research on this. No worries about this? And has adult marijuana use gone up? Um, you know, it's a little harder to measure because uh, now it's in the open and people admit it, right? 
That would make it easier to measure. Right, before. I mean, so 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 where it came from to where it is. I mean, if when it's illegal and, and, and somebody calls you on the phone and says you use it, you're, you're less likely to be honest with – it's like in Russia when you said, you like Putin? Yeah, 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 I like, I like Putin. Uh, you never know who's calling. So, um, no, I, I think it's been, been good. I think it's ultimately a matter of personal responsibility. It's up to, you know, if you want to – uh, use marijuana if you want to drink, if you want to smoke. That's your prerogative. I mean, that's not – the government shouldn't be deciding that for you. So um, that's that's simply a matter of personal responsibility, and people can make whatever decisions they want in their lives. That's libertarian. Colorado's budget has not increased during your tenure. But part of that is that Colorado has a balanced budget law that says you can't go into the yeah. And, and, you know, when I was in Congress, I sponsored a federal balanced budget amendment. We need that. We need a federal balanced budget amendment. And and look, I mean, people say, oh, what if there's a – I mean, you can build into it. And, and the, absolutely, you can say, look, if if there's a war or a crisis, it can be suspended for a year. One of the versions I sponsored with Justin Amash, a great former congressman, was that we it has to be balanced on a rolling basis, meaning for three on a three-year rolling basis. And it, was the, it was the requirement as opposed to necessarily every year. But any of those are good. Um, yes, the federal government needs to have those same kinds of um, balanced budget requirements that many states have. Colorado has it. Leads to our fiscal health. We have record reserves. We have budget surpluses. We've been able to reduce the income tax twice. We're hoping to reduce the property tax rate uh, as well. And, and that, but this will never happen, mostly because your fellow Democrats oppose it. Oh, there's plenty of opposition from both sides, John, uh, to a balanced budget amendment. Uh, it's it's tough because fundamentally you're asking Congress to approve something that takes away Congress's power to spend. Um, it restricts their power to spend. Uh, I think the states would be easier. Uh, you remember a constitutional amendment needs two-thirds of Congress, three-quarters of the states. I think Democratic and Republican states, many states would say, yeah, Congress should balance their budget. But getting Congress to do it will be hard because ultimately they're saying, wait a second, we're going to impose this on ourselves that we can't spend more, which we're accustomed to doing. So that's – that's yeah, I'm not terribly – I share your lack of optimism. I don't blame it on either party. I don't think either party in Congress would pass a constitutional amendment to, to uh, balance the budget. And there's a silly Republican ad with somebody singing. Has anyone seen my car? No one is better at creating problems and then saying – I'm just the person to fix them. If your goal was more violent crime and homelessness, job well done. Job well done. Well, that didn't work. I won by 19 points. They did uh, very creative, the ads these days. They commissioned some singer to uh, sing that. I think it was like, you know, like a one minute ad, one of those rare longer ads. Um, I was flattered. Um, but no, we're, we're taking all those things very seriously. As you know, there's been an increase in crime across the country from Florida to Texas to California to Colorado. Um, we are countering that with investing in more and better policing, uh, youth interdiction programs. We have tougher laws now on auto theft. We increase the classification of the penalty for auto theft. We also have better technology we're deploying. My goal is that we make Colorado one of the 10 safest states over the next five years. Uh, we're currently in the middle of the pack in terms of safety a little higher on risk of auto theft, a little bit lower on some of the violent crimes. But we want to be top 10, and so we're, we're really tackling that head on. But at the moment, your opponents were largely right. Colorado is number one in auto theft, cocaine use, bank robberies. They said you were number one. You're actually number four, but that's not good. Yeah, those are some of those we're higher on. We're a little bit uh, lower than average on some of the violent crimes and assaults. Uh, but I think that what, again, the reason I was able to win by 19 points is we said, okay, here's what we're going to do on auto theft. Here's what we're going to do on reducing robberies and theft and, and homelessness. What are you going to do? So for auto theft, as an example, uh, we passed, got money through the state budget for uh, better technology, uh, for uh, funding prosecutors in many of our judicial districts to specifically focus on going after auto theft because we found that a lot of the low-level auto thefts where the car was ditch somewhere. They simply weren't being prosecuted. Uh, we have funding for police um, and departments to recruit and retain law enforcement as well as train law enforcement uh, and tougher criminal penalties around um, auto theft. So I think it's beginning to work. Um, auto theft is beginning to decrease and we're turning the corner and we hope that continues over the next few years. Last question from your Republican opponents. He tries to act like a moderate, Jared Polis does, and he's a total, total far left activist 
who's destroyed our energy industry. Well, you know, again, none of this worked. I won by 19 points. So you're kind of, you know, rehashing the campaign right, there. But, but you're, um, you're ordering- we, have a, we have a very strong energy industry in Colorado. So I, I don't know how anybody could uh, think that it's been destroyed. Obviously, or the oil- will be destroyed. Yeah. You're ordering a 30% reduction in oil and gas emissions. That sounds like it's going to- Triple the business. Well, it's not in isolation. Uh, the oil and gas companies, uh, you know, are going to be able to reach that. And it simply means things like rather than moving oil and gas in trucks, they're able to do it on pipelines. Uh, we've largely eliminated So pipelines flaring. are good things. Pipelines are far more efficient from a climate perspective than running trucks, diesel trucks in and out. Now, maybe someday you'll get to electric trucks and those are more efficient. But right now it's diesel versus pipeline. So the oil and gas on pipeline is is more efficient from a pollution perspective. We pipelines much, are safer too. Yeah, well, the, the trucks are, are are also yeah. I mean, pipelines they all any kind of energy has its issues, right? Whether it's wind or solar or nuclear or oil and gas. But Colorado is really a hotbed of all forms of energy. So you talk about oil and gas, largely it depends on the price of oil and gas, how much activity we have in our state. Solar is booming in our state with 300 days of sunshine. Wind is booming; it's the lowest current cost of energy about two and a half cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, we're focused on geothermal, huge opportunities in geothermal electric with the heat beneath our feet. It's kind of the initiative I worked on as chair of the Western Governors Association. But a 30% reduction in two years is realistic? Yeah, absolutely. It, it simply means that um, more will be done on pipelines rather than trucks, uh, completely eliminate, eliminating flaring, uh, moving from uh, diesel drilling to electric drilling. A lot of things that are already underway and uh, we hope to accelerate in Colorado um, so that we can have uh, good air quality at the same time as support uh, the energy sector. Let's talk about Democrats and Republicans for a moment. You said Democrats are pro-freedom. I would say we're still the, we're the more pro-freedom and pro-liberty of the two parties. But Democrats are against school choice. They want to restrict gun ownership, raise taxes on capitalists. Well, I look, I think that... Um, the, well, some of the biggest threats to freedom today are uh, from Republican governors uh, talking about when and how you have a kid and making that decision for you, uh, talking about who you love and who you can marry. Um, those are very personal decisions that uh, Republican governors are trying to make for people. Uh, I think there's a broad— Are Republican governors still trying to dictate who you can marry? Of course, absolutely. Um, look at what's going on in a number of states. I mean, you have— uh, kind of out, outright war against uh, uh, the LGBTQ community. Obviously, currently, you know, the marriage uh, protected by the Supreme Court precedent. Now there's an additional body of law around it, but it's um, tenuous. Uh, it's tenuous given the, the current decisions of the Supreme Court. No, no group of people wants to say, wait a minute, I have to rely on the goodwill of the court just to marry who I love. Um, Democrats are a broad coalition. Um, are there some that aren't for school choice? I'm sure there are. There's others that are. Uh, President Obama was generally very good on charter schools and school choice. We have a robust school choice system in Colorado. Look at our, our biggest district, Denver, for instance, when they elect their school board, because it's a Democratic city, pretty much the people, all people running are Democrats, and they have people that are pro-school choice and people that are anti-school choice, and whichever side wins, wins, but they're all Democrats. So I think that it's a diversity of opinion on the Democratic Party. If I'm a baker or a website designer, and I oppose gay marriage. I, it's okay to force me to make a cake or a website for your marriage? That's a really tough one, John. So you get into kind of these. So first of all, I certainly agree with if you're a public accommodation, a public business, you're a store, let's say storefront, you can't say no blacks, no Jews, no gays. You can't discriminate, right? Now you get into the creative side, obviously on the other extreme. You're an artist who works by commission. Obviously, you don't have to accept a commission uh, to paint something or do something that you don't agree with. I mean, you can reject it for whatever reason you want. So now there's a gray area in the middle, right, where what's creative and what's a public accommodation. And that's kind of what's being hashed out. Um, now, I think many on the progressive side think not always as a matter of goodwill. We think that some of the folks trying to chip away at the non-discrimination protection have a broader agenda than just trying to protect, you know, truly creative individuals. If you look at this particular case, it was a very contrived case, this uh, 303 case. It never really happened. I mean, there was no business making wedding invitations. There were no gay people that wanted it done. Uh, a very bizarre set of facts to make a decision on. But obviously a legitimate discussion to say, where is it a public accommodation, which I agree should not have discrimination, 
And where is it something that is uh, creative and, and therefore up to the artist what they want to do? And to simplify, what, what about the freedom of the business owner? If I own a business and I say, I'm only going to serve people who wear no shoes, wh why isn't that my right? Uh, well, first of all, it's bad for uh, your business. And but that's so hopefully my choice. individuals will uh, make the optimal decisions. It's bad for the economy in general. But yeah, it has ramifications. I mean, if you're the only hardware store in town, and you say people, certain people can't shop here. Um, you know that means. But this was people, not the only bakery, or the only website. Well, this gets into again whether it was creative or not. Largely, these things sort themselves out. But I think it's very important that if we aspire to a society that is blind on race and gender discrimination and sexual orientation discrimination, that yes, we make sure that um, people can uh, get served in public businesses, whoever they want. Um, there are, again, institutions in society that are allowed to discriminate, and those are like private clubs and things like that. But if you hold yourself out as doing business with, with anybody, as a, for instance, a store, then yeah, you do business with anybody. But you spoke out against these recent Supreme Court decisions. You yeah. The, the, I'm, I'm, you know, again, skeptical of the tone and direction. I mean, is there, I, I, is there a legitimate way that a legislature could work to define what's creative and what's a public accommodation. I'm sure there is. It's, it's going to be very elusive in today's society, John, because I truly think that, again, on the Republican side, many are not actually trying to define creative business. They're trying to more in a broader way get rid of non-discrimination. And then there are many on the left for whom this would be kind of a uh, untouchable area. But yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, there's, there is a type of work that is creative and, and and obviously you can't force an artist to accept a commission uh, if they don't want to paint it or they don't want right. to do Another it, decision so. you criticized was paying off all these student loans, which mm -hmm. President Biden wanted to do. But why should someone who doesn't go to college or someone who does pay off their loans have to pay for people like you and me who went to the same overpriced college, why should they have to pay for those loans? Well, there is a problem with costs in higher education, and there's no question that the federal uh, policy, um, including both student loans, Pell Grants, absolutely helps fuel the increase in costs. But it's also a real-life reaction to it. I mean, it's a simple reaction. College costs too much, so how can the federal government make it more affordable for me? Why is it but what they really should do is look at the cost drivers. And there's a lot of money wasted in higher ed. People should focus on the results, uh, aligning investment in Isn't outcomes. Isn't more money wasted because the feds throw money at the students? <laughs> Free loans. Well, yes and no. I mean, the federal government could, with a thoughtful approach, create incentives around reducing costs. They're not doing that. They're kind of doing the easy thing, which is throwing money at it. Throwing money at something is always easier. Um, and again, it helps people afford college, but it doesn't affect the systemic drivers and the misincentives and disincentives that lead to these high costs. A few more on who's for freedom, Republicans or Democrats. Democrats have been more eager to censor content on social media that turned out to be true. I don't think so, uh, John. Look, who's banning TikTok and banning social media? Those are Republican governors. I haven't heard of a single Democratic governor banning, trying to ban social media. And I'm not being hyperbolic. Literally, there have been Republican states, Republican governors, where they've banned and put severe restrictions on uh, TikTok. Montana as a state, I think, is one of the states that the Republican legislature and Republican governor either banned or severely restricted one of the social media platforms, TikTok. But it was the Democratic administration that said, you can't say the virus began in China. You can't say masks might not help. Uh, well, it's Democrats who got me well, pretty much banned from Facebook because I say climate change is not an emergency. Well, wait, wait, why do you say it's Democrats, John, it's it's a it's a company that did it. They were pressured by a Democratic administration. I think they make their own business decisions, and it's a prerogative of companies to do that, right? I mean, uh, if you run a social media platform, like whether you like what Elon Musk is doing with Twitter or not, you can just not use Twitter or use Twitter, right? So it's kind of up to um, these companies to make these decisions. So I, I think that your, your your blame should, if you're upset with people, should be with the executives and the companies that are banning you. Um, not, I blame them not, too. Yeah. I mean, there was no law that made them do that, to be clear. Politicians like to talk. I'm sure many of them said, you should do this, you should do this, you know, whatever. But those are just words. There, there were not any laws passed that made any of these platforms restrict you in any way. 
But government has the guns, and these companies say we don't want them to punish us. So they tend to do what the president and his people suggest. Yeah. Well, again, I, I think if you look at who's banning social media, it is more Republican states and Republican governors. Uh, I'm sure there's voices on both sides that are restrict that want to restrict social media. I mean, it's uh, it's no question. I would look at what laws are passed rather than just what people say, though. I mean, politicians can say whatever they want, but there actually have been laws that have banned social media passed by Republican legislators and signed by Republican governors. Democrats support private property rights to build housing on your own land? I sure hope so, John. We need that in our state. So this is our big fight right now. And uh, I, we were, we're talking about Montana a lot, but Montana got this through. Republican legislature, Republican governor, much of their credit. What we're trying to say is you own land in Colorado, you own a home, whatever. It should be your right, meaning you don't have to do paperwork, file. It should be your right to build an accessory dwelling unit or a duplex on your own property that you own. I free don't of have government to beg you for permission and kiss your ring. You don't have to do any of that. So that's what we're trying to do. Now, look, let's also talk about the extreme. Of course, is it your right to be able to build a... 30-story tower in a residential neighborhood? No, because that does affect your neighbor. It affects their view. It affects the neighborhood. So, you know, 30-story tower, very reasonable you can't build. But to say, can you build a duplex or an accessory dwelling unit? Absolutely, that should be a right. Is that your neighbor's business? No. It's just your business and what you want to do and what you want to build. Uh, we are trying to figure that out in Colorado because that is the solution to high home prices, John. It's to remove these artificial constraints on supply. You know, as you know, in basic economics, uh, price is a function of supply and demand. Demand is high in Colorado. People want to live there. That's wonderful. But we've constrained supply by saying, no, you can't build. You can't do this. You, even though you have this lot, you can't build more than this one house. So how do we let more homes be built, which will reduce costs for both rent and for purchase? That is our big focus right now, and we welcome support from both sides of the aisle. And finally, you made a statement in favor of equity. You want people working in government to incorporate an equity mindset. What's the difference between equity and equal opportunity? We want to be fair to everybody. We have a diverse state workforce. We want the state workforce to look like the state of Colorado. We want everybody to be comfortable working for the state, uh, regardless of their race or their religion or uh, sexual orientation or gender identity. So as a, as a model employer, uh, it's something we value. And, and it's also reacting to the uh, market need. I mean, we need people to clear, to clear snow from the roads. We need people to be on the you know, state uh, trooper organization and protecting our streets. So uh, we want to make sure we can uh, have a positive working environment for everybody. But this word equity has come out of the critical race theory argument. It, it doesn't mean treat people equally. Know. It you means know, equal results. No, it might, John, in some people's heads. Most of us haven't studied critical race theory and don't really know what it is. I haven't studied it. Um, the word equity long predates that, I think. I mean, as far as I can tell, this critical race theory is relatively new. But I mean, the word equity has been around since you were a kid, since I was a kid. I mean, equity, uh, it generally means, you know, fairness is what I think. And so how do you treat people with respect in an equitable way? Um, and uh, I don't know what it means in critical race theory. I don't think most people do. That's why, again, many of us in the mainstream, uh, whether you're middle or center right or center left, you sort of look at this whole thing. Why is everybody talking about this weird, this critical race theory thing that, what is it, something that a few graduate students write about, maybe at Berkeley? I don't know. But like, that's not how most of us view what, what equity means. You're an unusual Democrat in that you're open to taking these questions and oh, happy to. talking to Stossel TV. So thank you, Governor Paulus. Thank you, John. Hope you like this video. Who else would you like me to interview in this longer than normal format? Let us know in the comments.